I currently serve as the acting US Global AIDS Coordinator, and I'm so pleased on behalf of our team, as well as the interagency across the various US government agencies to welcome you today to PEPFAR Strategy Vision 2025 listening session. We've organized these listening sessions around key stakeholders and constituents, as you can see here. This is the fourth of a series that we've completed thus far, and we're so thrilled that our implementing partners are joining us today. Each of the sessions has the same general format with a brief presentation outlining the epidemiologic situation and an overview of PEPFAR, and then we'll have a, a longer session facilitated by the pan with a panel of esteemed stakeholders um, that have joined us today. We'll then open up for moderated comments and reflections by all attendees, and then we'll summarize key themes. As noted earlier, all sessions will be recorded and shared, and the slides will also be shared. Moving into the epidemiologic and PEPFAR overview, here we see the global HIV AIDS situation. On the left, we see significant declines in new infections and deaths since 2003 and the global treatment cascade on the right. These collective successes are a result in large part to our, collect, our collaborative efforts to scale prevention and treatment programs around the globe. Looking regionally, we see Eastern and Southern Africa with the most significant epidemiologic impact as a result of controlled epidemics in many high burden countries. Here we see the trends in new infections and deaths on the top, the distribution of new infections by population on the bottom left, resource needs in the middle, and testing and treatment cascade as well as gaps on the right. In Western and Central Africa, looking at these same figures, we see continuing declines as well as in Asia and the Pacific. And, and here, you know, the, the distribution of new infections by population are concentrated among key populations. In the Caribbean, we also see continuing declines. And in Latin America, we're seeing a relatively steady state. In Eastern Europe and Central Asia, we see increasing trends. New infections con concentrated among key populations. And, an, and real emphasis, I would say, in terms of our need to, to focus on implementation of evidence-based policies and practices to impact HIV in the region. What has remained consistent over time, and really since the inception of PEPFAR in 2003 until present day, is the unwavering bipartisan congressional and presidential leadership and support of PEPFAR. As many of you know, PEPFAR provides support in now 55 countries, and our investment is aligned to, is aligned to HIV burden of disease. Here we see a summary of PEPFAR's latest program results with 18.2 million women, men, and children on life-saving treatment. This represents an additional 1 million in the past six months alone. We also see other indicators here with circumcision, orphans and vulnerable children, um, as well as some of our prevention um, efforts for adolescent girls and young women. We continue to make strides together in all of these areas. Here we see the trends over time of the PEPFAR budget in the blue line and the increasing results for circumcision in yellow and treatment in the blue bars, respectively. These data are through fiscal year 21, quarter two. So we still have two more quarters to add. 
And our commitment to treatment continuity and growth is clear. Despite the peaks in COVID-19, as you can see here in, in the peach graph. I want to commend um, the work that has happened across the globe, particularly with, with ICAP and other partners in implementing the FIAs. Um, what we see here are, is significant progress toward the UNAIDS 95-95-95 goals. Here are select countries across Africa that have completed the, the population-based surveys, and we're indicating results here. We also see community viral suppression in orange. We've made strides together also in public, public and private partnerships, particularly with our DREAMS partnership, focused on adolescent girls and young women, preventing new infections among them. And we continue to make progress, and we also see gaps in our key populations programming. On these next series of slides, we'll go through um, we'll go through them quickly, but we wanted to show some data here uh, indicating the status of epidemic control among a number of countries uh, where we work. And a big thanks to UNAIDS for much of the data that is presented in this deck and particularly here. So these are a series of countries that are at epidemic control of HIV as we look at new infections and total deaths. Zimbabwe, Kenya, Malawi, Lesotho. Here we have Ethiopia, Rwanda, Iswatini at epidemic control of HIV. Thailand, Nepal, Cambodia. Burundi, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, and DRC. Burkina Faso, Senegal, Togo, Mali, Liberia, Trinidad, and Tobago. Again, all at epidemic control of HIV. We'll now take a look at a series of countries that are near epidemic control of HIV. And these include Botswana, Haiti, and Uganda, as well as Vietnam and Guatemala. And then there's finally a series of countries with declining new infections, but not yet at control of HIV. And these include Angola, Ghana, Mozambique, and Nigeria, South Sudan, Ukraine, Tanzania, Zambia, and South Africa. And again, just to note that the Y axis is very different um, across all of these countries here. Another series of countries not at epidemic control of HIV yet, and that includes Tajikistan, Indonesia, Panama, Guyana, Jamaica, and the Dominican Republic. Looking at gaps, opportunities, and the end state, here we're showcasing some important data from UNAIDS as well, and in looking at distribution of new infections as well globally and regionally, as well as by age and sex. And here, just to make two key points. In Sub-Saharan Africa, despite the gains that we showed, 52% of new infections are among 15 to 49 year old females, even though they account for 24% of the population. So we must collectively continue to decrease new infections in this population, particularly with the youth bulge. Second, there is variability of coverage and accessibility of critical HIV prevention services for key populations. We see this across countries and across regions. So we must continue to focus on these populations and address barriers to, to access um, for services for these populations. Here we see coverage of ART by adults. In, in pink and by children in orange over the last decade. And two points to note here, 40% of children living with HIV had suppressed viral loads in 2020 versus 67%. We have a ways to go. Nearly two thirds of the children not on treatment are those that are 15 to 14, sorry, five to 14 year olds. So again, a gap that we need to 
we need to uh, make sure we're addressing. COVID-19 continues to be a vulnerability affecting the program and, and the beneficiaries we serve. We've been adapting the program for the past 18 months to not only protect the gains, but also to accelerate the gains, but also to help respond to COVID-19. And we've been doing this by leveraging the, the PEPFAR platform that really offers a care delivery platform. And this includes um, the, the investments that we've made over the many, many years in laboratories, healthcare facilities, healthcare and community workers, and the supply chain that exists. Here we see HIV investments by funder and PEPFAR supported countries. Again, you know, to really depict, depict here that we're not alone in this and we have to be aligned with the global fund as well as the domestic government resources as we move into the future. In red, we see PEPFAR. In blue, global fund, gray, the resources from the domestic government and in orange, other funders. Here we see projected gross domestic product growth versus HIV prevalence and persistent economic problems across the board in countries with high HIV prevalence, as indicated with the red dot and high, high mid to high income status, as you can see in the rightmost part of the graph. One key component to our approach to sustainability is delivery of services through local partners and communities. We currently have 55% of new funds going directly to local partners in blue across, across these graphs here. And you can see that in the leftmost graph. This varies by country and by care and treatment, which is noted in the middle graph, as well as prevention, which is in the rightmost graph, where we have less than 40% of new funds going to local partners. So in the end, what does a sustained response look like? Here are some factors um, that, that, we would, that we would like to share. First, a whole of domestic approach, including government and communities to successfully sustain epidemic control of HIV. Second, function, sufficient functional technical and managerial capacity that is in place to ensure that we can continue um, to move forward. Financially sustaining essential services is also key to, to meet emerging needs. HIV service delivery integrated into broader public and private care delivery systems. Ensuring that there's a robust public health response in place to monitor and track existing and emerging threats and quality assurance to ensure that we continue positive health outcomes. With that backdrop, and moving us to what brings us here today, this is the development of the PEPFAR five-year strategy. We started developing the strategy with your help and that of others since, late, since last fall, as bulleted here, and look forward to, to the dialogue today, as well as dialogue moving forward to continue to gather input and perspectives from all. <laughs> Um, sorry, there's a lot of background. Thank you. Um, so again, just wanting to note that we've started this in the fall together with all of you. Um, we've laid out um, some guiding principles last December and these, these listening sessions that we're holding um, this month are, are absolutely critical to continue to, to gather ideas and insights from all of you. This will feed into our country and regional 20, um, operating plan 2022 guidance development um, that we will be engaging in as well as longer term planning. The strategy for the next five years will be focused on achieving sustainable, equitable and resilient control of HIV. We need to make sure that we're continuing to support global efforts related to the Sustainable Development Goal 3 and working closely and coordinated with the Global AIDS Strategy 2021 to 2026 that was recently released by UNAIDS and adopted by countries, as well as Global Fund's post-22 strategy that is in development. 
There are three proposed goals and a series of proposed objectives uh, for the next PEPFAR strategy. I won't read all of those um, because you all have been given uh, this in PDF format earlier, but just to, um, to underscore uh, the goals. Goal one, to accomplish the mission, 95-95-95, sustained, equitable, client-centered HIV prevention and treatment services supported by six pr proposed goals listed here. Goal two, is to build enduring capabilities, resilient and capacitated country health systems, communities, and local partners with a series of five objectives proposed here. And finally, goal three is to broaden the base of support, partner for greater impact, burden sharing, and sustainability with five objectives proposed here. Now I'll hand over to Laura Porter from CDC and George Syberry from USAID, as well as Aram Zaidi from ASCAC to uh, move us through the next set of uh, sec sections uh, for today's session. Uh, so with that, I'll kick it over to Laura. Over to you to facilitate the panel. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anjali. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the listening session today. I'm pleased to collaborate with my interagency colleagues, George and Iram, to facilitate this part of the session. So we're really privileged today to be joined by a panel of distinguished representatives from PEPFAR implementing partners. Together, we have this opportunity to reflect on where we've been, where we, I think, unexpectedly find ourselves now and where we need to be in the future. Just to set the stage, the panelists have received the draft outline of the strategy and all four of the questions, um, which Anjali had shown and I believe may be posted. Oh, David is posting now in the chat. Um, so we've invited each panelist to share recommendations about what they feel is missing in the strategy or could or should be emphasized or refined and to address their priorities in the other three questions as time may allow today. So I'll ask everyone to try to stay within the six minutes and then we'll hope to have the opportunity to come back around for you to reflect on one another's comments if time allows. So I'll introduce all of the panelists and then um, I'll ask each in this order to offer their recommendations for the PEPFAR strategy. Um, so if everyone can come on camera, I can't see all the panelists, but um, so Dr. Andrew Kambugu is a Sunday McKinnell executive director at the Infectious Diseases Institute or IDI uh, at the College of Health Sciences at McCary University in Uganda. Just to note that IDI is a local implementing partner in support of Uganda, the Uganda Ministry of Health. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Dr. Wafa El Sadr is the Global Director of ICAP at Columbia University and Professor of Epidemiology and Medicine. Thank you, Wafa. Uh, Mr. Patrick Fine is the Chief Executive Officer of FHI 360. Welcome and thank you, Patrick. Dr. Celia Maxwell is the Associate Dean for Research and Professor of Medicine at Howard University in Washington, DC. Thank you, Celia, and welcome. And Mr. Chip Lyons is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Elizabeth Glazier Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Uh, welcome, Chip, and thank you. So welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Andrew, I'd like to just go ahead and kick it off, if I may. I'd like to invite you to comment first. Um, and what do you feel is missing in the draft strategy or might be emphasized or refined, and as you wish, to address any of the other questions? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Laura. And can I check that you can hear me well? Great. Uh, so greetings uh, to the audience and my fellow panelists from Makere University here in Kampala, where the Institute is best. Um, it's really a great privilege to be part of this panel discussion and to share my perspectives and experience as a leader of an African best implementing partner. And actually, before I go into uh, the specifics of my remarks, I thought I would use this great platform to express a profound gratitude to the people of the United States and their government 
for an unparalleled contribution to the lives and livelihoods uh, of those beneficiaries of PEPFA, including my countrymen and women. I really am in agreement with Secretary Blinken's observation earlier about the American leadership in this effort. And um, I wanted to really say thank you to the US government, thank you to PEPFA, and to all the US government agencies that we work with. It's really great. Now, to my remarks, um, my first comment is to applaud PEPFA and specifically the team that uh, has worked on the current draft that we're discussing. And I want to say uh, I was pleased to note uh, specific elements within the draft that resonated with me as somebody who's been uh, at the front and center of the response for the past decade and a half. So I want to highlight about four things that I was pleased to see before I, I talk about what I see as potential areas of uh, modification. I, I was pleased to see that within, object, within the, obje the goals and objectives, particularly goal one, a, a people-centered approach. Uh, as a physician, but also as uh, someone based in Africa, I think this is a very important articulation within the guidelines. Uh, many of you know that in Africa, we have this philosophy of Ubuntu, uh, which talks about humanity. But also as a doctor, I've seen firsthand how it is easy for professionals like myself to be quite paternalistic when we're dealing with our friends who are living with HIV. And I have learned over the last few years to really um, adopt an attitude where the people we care for have got to be at the center of whatever we are doing. Uh, among other things, I think it enhances their own responsibility for their own health. So if you take, for example, the need to adhere to medication, it's not easy to take medication, but if somebody understands the need, then it, it is a lot easier. So I'm, I'm happy to see that. I'm happy to see that uh, we're looking at synergies and collaborations between uh, different entities, particularly from a funding perspective, because we are in an environment where every dollar counts and with new threats like COVID-19, taking away resources, uh, we really need to make sure that we're making the best use of the resources that we have. I was also pleased to see that um, we are integrating emerging innovations and science in the response. And here again, I give credit to the US and other partners who lead in generating evidence that drives the response. Uh, but finally, and, and I think quite selfishly, <laughs> I was very pleased to see uh, the prominence of local partners, local governments in the response. And as an IP, I really think that if the response is to be sustainable, we really have to hold our African governments and African institutions accountable and uh, give them more prominence so that they can carry on the work. Because I think we, it's not fair to expect uh, that for the long term, the resources will predominantly come from our friends uh, uh, from abroad. So I thought I should highlight those things which um, I wanted to applaud. Um, I think turning to opportunities for um, tweaking the current guidelines, I thought I'll point out the centrality of data and maybe it has to do with my background as a clinician, but also as a researcher. I, I do know that in, I think go to, uh, they highlight the centrality of systems to monitor uh, using data. But I, I really think that a, a data-centered approach needs more prominence. And um, I, I wonder whether that it should be extracted and made a, a very specific thing because data keeps all of us honest, accountable. It also focuses um, interventions to those pockets that may be neglected. So I, I thought I would call out the issue around the centrality of data. I also thought there might be one or two opportunities for more concision within the objectives, because these documents, being public documents, um, sometimes people benefit from more summary than more detail. So I look, for example, at uh, objective 1.3 and 1.4, which focus on prevention, but also being in Africa, I know that a lot of the hanging fruit for prevention are in key populations. I thought that maybe there might be an opportunity to merge objectives 1.3 and objectives uh, 1.4. In terms of uh, what uh, the PEPFA program will look 
like a sustained epidemic control. I appreciate the slide that uh, was shown by uh, the chair of the session. The one thought I had in terms of uh, my, my own experience and being best in Africa is around a mindset. Uh, I think we should include things that talk about mindset, context, uh, including culture. And, and here the specifics I have is um, once again, local ownership. If, if I think we can only get the sustained uh, epidemic control if it's very clear that African governments uh, appreciate the role they have to play uh, going forward. I think the other mindset I have is that I think it should be, we should not be shy to say that a sustained epidemic environment includes the fact that new infections should be treated as, as scandals, if I can say that. I think this, uh, this approach is being seen in the elimination of mother to child uh, transmission. So I think part of the sustained response is uh, creating an environment where we see new infections as profound failures of the system so that all the actors can, can then jump on it. Uh, in terms of main threats to HIV control, in the current context, we can't avoid uh, mentioning COVID-19. Uh, there's a lot to say, but I think based on my experience in Uganda uh, relating to COVID-19, what I have seen is the impact of COVID-19 plus the mitigation strategies, including lockdowns, severely hampering our momentum towards epidemic control, whether it's adherence to medication or to retention. But I want to highlight one particular impact, which is around, we've seen a spike in teenage pregnancies in Uganda during these lockdowns. And uh, many of you know that uh, a pregnancy means an, uh, an instance of unprotected sex. And I fear that we might begin to see pockets of new infections. I think what's doubly worrying is that uh, in this environment, access to proven tools like PrEP is not where we want it to be. So, this is kind of like a confluence on one hand of COVID-19 and then access to proven prevention strategies. So in my limited time, I thought I would highlight that particular thing. Um, perhaps before I exhaust my time, um, maybe I should talk about how PEPFA can continue to leverage its platform for broader health outcomes because at the Institute, we've, we've had a great experience here where we've leveraged our uh, HIV platforms to enhance uh, global health security capacity, including COVID response, not only centrally, but also in the regions where uh, we are the leading implementing partner. To give you a precise example, uh, during the lockdown, when we had to cut back on community engagement, we essentially repurposed our voluntary medical male circumcision team to become champions of infection prevention and control measures. So this is a clear example of repurposing people. But also um, across the board, uh, the ministry with the uh, support of the US CDC has allowed HIV implementing partners to really take the lead in supporting regional uh, local governments in using existing governance and implementation structures to make sure we tighten both the surveillance, but also the other pillars of the COVID response. Um, I would be keen to share more, but I'm conscious that we have other panelists who will make submission. So I'll be happy to uh, share any additional details when I get the opportunity. Once again, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew, for um, gracious and, and thoughtful um, comments and reflections. Um, a lot for us to think about and appreciate. Um, I'd like to move to Wafa if I could. Um, Wafa, uh, the floor is yours for the for the same. Do you feel anything is missing in the draft strategy might be emphasized or refined and as you wish to address any of the other questions? Your six minutes, please. Thank you. Wafa, I think we can't hear you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? Oh, there you go. Yes, perfect. Um, 
thank you for the opportunity, Laura and Anjali and others. And um, it is quite moving to be with all of you, uh, friends and colleagues, uh, this morning or this afternoon after uh, a tough year and a half. And um, I do hope that uh, we can be together uh, soon. Uh, this has been very difficult uh, times. So what I'm going to focus today on in my limited time are uh, a couple of uh, a couple of issues that I think uh, come to mind. One is um, uh, to start with and maybe to build on what Andrew said and also what Anjali presented is that obviously, as uh, Anjali mentioned, PEPFAR has been an enormous uh, success story. Uh, remarkable achievements, uh, as, as, as have been noted, uh, but these achievements have not been universal. And uh, those can be seen by the data that Anjali mentioned in terms of uh, differentiation in the way in which countries reached um, their goals and objectives, but also gaps within those, even in the countries that have achieved epidemic control. So we need to be conscious of exactly uh, what are we measuring and what are the data telling us? And this gets back to something that Andrew mentioned, which I strongly believe in and could be um, highlighted further in the plan. And that is the importance of measurement, the importance of data moving forward. And why is it important? I think data are important because again, they really give us a measure on what we are doing and how we are doing it and pinpoint with clarity and with precision where the gaps exist. So it's really important to, um, uh, to be able to, as we move forward, it becomes critically important to, to continue this centrality, uh, fe central feature of PEPFAR, which is that it is, uh, it is uh, based on a solid data and uh, not just a collection of data, but the analysis of the data and the use of the data. And I highlight the use of the data which I think is something that uh, in talking to country partners is so appreciated by ministries of health is this uh, transformation that has happened over the years in terms of having data at their fingertips and also being able to very nimbly use the data to guide their programs and their resource allocations. I want to touch on two types of data that are very important. I think we are much more familiar with, I think, the programmatic data, and these are very, very valuable and they tell us what we're doing and how we are doing it. And I think it's really critical moving forward to, to really focus on what is the most pragmatic, parsimonious data um, that should be collected that are most critical to guide the work moving forward. So I would say pragmatic, parsimonious, those are words that come to mind, uh, would be important to, to focus on. I do think we also need to um, think about uh, areas where we have not really had the robust data that we need to guide our, uh, to guide our programs. And these include data on prevention, uh, which has mentioned also been mentioned by Andrew, but also data on enablers, the social enablers, which are, we know are critically important. We know we can measure stigma, we can measure discrimination. We also know as well that it, there's a need for collection of data uh, from the perspective of the recipients of care themselves. So we need to kind of think more broadly in terms of what are the types of data that we want to focus on. Very importantly, of course, the data that we are focusing on now, but also to think beyond that to, like as I mentioned, a couple of areas uh, just now. I think another area where data would be incredibly useful is actually uh, thinking about how do we collect data on uh, institutional capacity. One of the important things moving forward, and we hear about this all the time, is the importance of our total commitment, everybody on this call, to capacity building and sustainability and so on. But we need to have metrics to also measure those as well. And there are certainly metrics that can be used to measure institutional capacity, whether that is at a, for a community organization or it is at a, sub, at a provincial or sub-national level, the capacity of our partners and, and key stakeholders in country is really vitally important to sustain the programs. Now, the other types of data is, um, the other type of data is a recognition that uh, programmatic data are very valuable, but they only tell us about the people we, we've reached. They don't tell us about the people we have not reached. And this is where I think the importance, continued importance of population data uh, comes into play. Because population data, whatever the population is, whether it be general population data or specific population data, 
provide an important scorecard uh, for the countries themselves and uh, to be able to see where they're at, as well as also help uh, develop a blueprint for the future, a blueprint for action. And they also demonstrate the gaps, they vividly demonstrate the gaps because they go beyond the programmatic data, the ones that the data that are focused on the people that come to us. So that's really valuable to then have this, the breadth of, of data that tell us where the gaps exist. And we know that there are gaps that have been identified through such surveys. They include, for example, of course, uh, gaps in reaching uh, children in terms of reaching adolescents, uh, young women in, as well. Men have also been left behind in, for many of our programs. Of course, key populations remain, again, uh, an important priority where we need data um, to guide our, our actions and, and other populations like migrants and refugees and so on. So we really need to be able to have this information to be able to act on the information. And that becomes very valuable. The other thing is very important as well, is we can think of achieving epidemic control as a static condition, that this is you achieve epidemic control and you just stay in epidemic control because as a static kind of uh, way of being, there are threats that can happen. COVID-19 is one of them, but there may be others. It could be civil unrest. It could be uh, changes in the, in the programmatic, in the HIV programs themselves. And I think having ongoing measurements of where countries are at, both at a national and subnational levels, is very and and for the specific populations of interest, uh, would be very valuable even for countries that have that have achieved what we're calling uh, epidemic control. And also realizing, of course, that within that heading of epidemic control, there are certainly gaps that have been identified, and we cannot uh, and we need to think about them and address them. The second area, so my first area was about data. I very quickly moved to the second area, and that I think also needs to be further highlighted, uh, similar to the data issue, needs to be highlighted as well moving forward. And that's the importance of evidence. Another key feature of PEPFAR, which has gained it the respect, admiration, support that Angeline mentioned uh, over the years, two things I think. One is a PEPFAR pro, uh, can provide data on its impact, that's really important, number one, and that PEPFAR is anchored in evidence. And that's really the second very important feature of this program. And this has meant that, uh, that PEPFAR is guided, uh, is, is supports implementation of adoption, adaptation, and scale up of what is supported by evidence and setting aside things that are not supported by evidence. And really, this is really a critically important feature that garners the respect for PEPFAR programming. But I think also PEPFAR has an important role as, as a critical platform to generate new evidence. And we sometimes underestimate this. Um, it, can, it not only is a user of evidence, but it can be and has been, but can be even more a generator of evidence to guide programs, to guide scale up and so on. And this means that, of course, that there needs to be the space for innovations. There needs to be the space for identifying uh, and measuring what works, what doesn't work, and also as well to be able to garner and distill some of these lessons so uh, through um, strong uh, evaluation programs or quality improvement collaboratives or other kinds of efforts so that actually uh, all of the rich information um, that is, uh, uh, can be learned uh, from, uh, from actually what PEPFAR is supporting and is doing. And I think some of these are some of the lessons learned from the COVID experience, for example, and the importance in distilling those lessons learned. The focus on the recipients of care, the differentiated service delivery models, um, the pivot to, um, uh, to be able to do uh, very quickly surveys and surveillance to measure what's happening with COVID. I think there are there's enormous richness in PEPFAR and its work that could also demonstrate its value, not for just the HIV agenda, but way beyond that. So I'll stop here and um, thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Wafa. So much to think about. For those of you who know me, you'd think I'd put, put Andrew and Wafa up to this, and I haven't <laughs> for their points highlighting data. Um, but um, but I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to hear them. Um, so, and Ira may be laughing about this as well. 
Um, let's go on to uh, Patrick. Thank you so much, Wafa. Um, on to Patrick, please. Um, the same invite you to uh, reflect on what you think is missing in the draft strategy might be emphasized or refined and as you wish to address any of the other questions. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Laura. And greetings, colleagues. Um, let me start with uh, uh, some words of appreciation to Angela and her team and some um, points of appreciation for the strategy as it's being presented. Um, first of all, um, I want to thank you for convening these listening sessions. It's not only a smart design approach, but it's also good for building momentum behind the strategy. And we've already heard in the two perspectives shared today from Andrew and from Wafa how valuable getting these uh, different perspectives can be. Uh, second, um, I'm pleased to see the strategy deliberately aligning with the SDGs and with the UNAID strategy to provide, uh, it's, it's essential we have a coherent international approach. And I also hope that as this strategy um, is elaborated that both uh, UNAIDS in particular and the Global Fund will align with PEPFAR. So it, it needs to be a two-way street. Um, I like the practical strategic approach. It starts from where we are. It incorporates major lessons that we've learned over the last couple of decades. It seeks to preserve and extend PEPFAR's remarkable achievements. I think it will be important to emphasize that. And finally, um, you know, just based on the, the overview, it's succinct, it's targeted. I think the three goals are appropriate and they provide a good framework for organizing future action. Now, as you think about elaborating this strategy, I think it will be essential to build in the context of the current moment. Um, the strategy will need to be situated uh, with a clear sense of the current state of the world, both with respect to the state of the HIV AIDS pandemic, which, which Angele pr presented earlier, but also with respect to the COVID pandemic, the resource demands for economic recovery and the resource demands to address concerns around global health security and future pandemic preparedness. So that's the reality, that's the operating environment we, we're, we're in. And the strategy needs to situate itself and speak to that context. Um, it can't, um, my advice would be, it would be, it, it is, it can't be a, just a standalone strategy that, that doesn't take into account these other tectonic changes in the global political and public health operating environment. And I think it's better to get ahead of these issues by uh, addressing them directly than to have them overwhelm or chip away at the, um, uh, at the at the intentions uh, laid out in the strategy. Now, when I look at the goals, um, goal one and two, they strike me as um, unfinished business, as securing the gains to date. And I think that it's really important to make the case that there have been these tremendous advances, both in um, epidemic control, as we've mentioned, in the methods that we use, in how data is, no, no other development program in any sector uses data as effectively and as rigorously as PEPFAR does. So we've had these very remarkable achievements. Those need to be consolidated um, and they need to um, be sustained. So we've got to secure those gains today we also have to address weaknesses and gaps that we're aware of, and I think that the strategy uh, does that. If I look at the objectives that it lays out, it does address where we know there are issues. Here's my one um, suggestion or a couple of suggestions about where there should be increased emphasis. I think there should be increased emphasis on prevention. Now, objective 1.3 does speak to, uh, to prevention, but as we look at countries that are getting close to 95, 95, 95, we still see a significant flow of new cases, as Wafa um, alluded to. And uh, one, that makes me 
question whether 95, 95, 95 is even a sufficient overarching goal for the strategy. And, and I would um, suggest that the PEPFAR team look at that or that we as a community look at that. But second, it, it suggests to me that there needs to be increased emphasis on prevention, a specific, you know, and especially on biomedical prevention, increased incentives to innovate around how do we increase prevention? How do we increase uptake of PrEP? Um, for example, maybe a PrEP funding earmark, like we had a, a funding earmark for VMMC. Um, but I think that increased funding and emphasis on prevention should be targeted to populations that are still the most underserved, which include key populations, adolescent girls and young men. So again, I think echoing some of what Wafa was saying. Um, I'd like to see a next generation of the DREAMS program. I think that has been uh, successful in terms of building uh, momentum and support and addressing some of the structural realities that put people at risk and pose um, some of the, the biggest obstacles to epidemic control. Um, so um, I would I would encourage that as as the strategy is elaborated. And then uh, finally, just to mention that the key population investment fund, I think, has been a, a an effective instrument within um, the existing program. It's been a good tool for incentivizing prevention. It provides a framework that PEPFAR can build upon to expand access to prevention for underserved groups. So I, I would um, recommend that that be incorporated into the new strategy. And that, you know, is thinking about what are the instruments and tools that we build into the strategy to uh, to ensure that it achieves its objectives. Finally, let me end on goal three. For me, goal three is more articulating the end game. And um, I think it, I think that for me, reading the overview, this goal three was the goal that most needs elaboration um, to build out a bold vision with clear steps for transitioning to true national epidemic control programs along the lines of what Andrew was saying. Andrew, I completely agree with uh, the points that you were making about really empowering national governments and national and communities to be in control of this. And I think it, it would be extremely um, beneficial for PEPFAR in its strategic vision to, to articulate what it sees as those steps to really um, transition to more domestic financing. To, to describe a vision of what that balance looks between external and internal financing. And what kind of incentives does PEPFAR need to put in place to make that balance um, uh, be realized, to realize that as an objective? Um, my own sense is that the operating structures um, for a program that is where, where national governments and actors are empowered to really control the programs, to, to be the decision makers, um, and also are responsible for a significant portion of the financing, that those will necessarily look different than the structures we have today. So I would advise that rather than thinking that that this next strategy period will look pretty much that, that the structures, the, the delivery mechanisms will pretty much look like they do today, but with with local partners instead of, of you know, a bigger role for local partners and a smaller role for international partners. I actually think that it, it will look quite different uh, when, when ministries of health, uh, when national institutes when they're in the driver, really in the driver's seat, that it would be really useful to, for for the PEPFAR team and for all of us to think what what will that operating structure look like, and what kind of business models um, should we be um, 
moving towards and again incentivizing and encouraging so that we can realize that objective. For example, from the US government side, maybe an MCC type of model would be appropriate at this point where you create incentives for national ownership. You, re you, you require responsibilities that all both parties have to uh, adhere to or, or all parties have to adhere to. Um, and you you really transfer control. So I, I would suggest take a look at that model and see if there are features of it that would uh, work as effective incentives to to achieve the objective of that end game, which is really a transition to to uh, empowered local actors. Um, I think in that sense, the private sector, we need to think of new roles for the private sector, not just the traditional roles that, that they've played in product development and supply chain, but new roles like in prevention. What could be the role of private sector of businesses in advancing, promoting, uh, maybe requiring prevention practices? Uh, finally, I think that um, when we look at the context, one of the issues that we're forced to uh, um, confront is the question about vertical programming versus integrated programming. And that's been like the third rail of the HIV AIDS conversation. We all know that. Um, even yesterday, there was new guidance issued by USAID about using the PEPFAR platform for COVID recovery or COVID response. And and um, I think Wafa, you mentioned that as well, or maybe it was Angeli who mentioned, you know, that we've got this in incredible infrastructure that can be purposed in this emergency or pandemic situation for COVID response. Um, I would I would recommend that the strategy very explicitly address the question of in this future state uh, do we envision a continued vertical kind of approach or do we envision a more integrated approach or is it some kind of hybrid like ring fenced financing within uh, within the health within a national health system um thank you patrick and thank you very much yeah yeah, I, I'm so sorry to cut to, to interrupt. I'm I, in the interest of time, it, you've given us so much to think about, and I really appreciate the uh, development of the ideas um, on these very big questions. Um, so thank you, um, uh, Celia. May I turn over to you, please? The same questions: What do you feel is missing in the draft strategy, or might be emphasized or refined? And as you wish to address any of the other questions, your six minutes, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. And I, I have to say at the outset that I'm honored to have the opportunity to share my thoughts with this distinguished panel. I personally uh, believe in looking at um, uh, the PEPFAR, the draft PEPFAR uh, strategy vision that it's, it's on track, I think, uh, to reach the Sustainable Development Goal uh, 3. Uh, by reaching its target uh, to end global AIDS epidemic by 2030. I specifically feel that SDG 3 uh, aligns well with PEPFAR's strategy on major interventional areas, such as addressing the key populations. I do have some different thoughts on uh, the whole, on the vision. Uh, I guess, colored in part by uh, some of what uh, what we do. So, for instance, I believe that a successful adaptation to prevailing public health challenges will require a paradigm shift, but it won't only include uh, the differentiated service delivery model, uh, but it has to include pharmacovigilance. Um, as I look at some of the uh, measures that are put in place to deal 
uh, collectively with COVID-19 and HIV is the multi-month dispensing, something that we have done in, in Zambia uh, uh, to allow patients uh, flexibility and uh, not to miss doses. However, I think that what's missing is the whole issue of pharmacovigilance. That is very important because when you have multi-month dispensing, let's say you give uh, people six months uh, worth of medication, you're missing out on the opportunity to address adverse drug reactions that are happening at the time they may be happening, um, where you might be able to course correct. Uh, additionally, we have found uh, that some of the patients had some issues like actual storage, uh, particularly if they're in a situation where no one else knows that they're on uh, these medications. So uh, that's uh, sort of uh, one thought. Um, I also uh, think that um, the objective, the, the private sector engagement uh, highlighted in objective three is certainly a plus, uh, but I think it should not only include the private sector for funding mechanisms, but also uh, involve the private sector uh, to help decrease congestion uh, in the clinics and the hospitals um, and even in pharmacies. Uh, one of the issues that we found uh, when we engage as part of an HBCU consortium in Zambia um, to ensure that we could uh, provide the best service in, um, in a coordinated fashion and make it sort of a, a one-stop shop um, uh, process. Uh, but I also think that as HBCUs, we have a, a unique uh, shared commonalities, certainly with the African diaspora, diaspora and how it has. And I believe that a program uh, modeled after the uh, Peace Corps, a health core program modeled after the Peace Corps, um, where we could utilize uh, the talent at HBCU, almost grooming them, uh, healthcare workers and new graduates to volunteer uh, in projects relating to HIV AIDS uh, prevention and management, especially in Africa, would be, I think, timely. Um, another thing that I thought about is the whole issue of transition and sustainability. I believe that those two uh, should be part, uh, a vital component of um, any work plan from the very beginning um, to ensure that all of our implementing partners, once you start a program, you are preparing the site uh, to be sustainable, and and to transition, uh, so to speak, from uh, the assistance that's being provided by PEPFAR. And we have an example of doing that. We were tasked uh, with identifying high volume hospitals in, in Zambia. Uh, 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 we made them a pilot and for one, we started from the very beginning preparing them to transition. And after about two and a half years, our hospital in Matero is transitioning to functioning uh, by themselves and also serving as technical assistance sites for others. So I think sustainability and transition has to be part and parcel of looking at any program from the beginning. Um, looking at HIV and COVID as an infectious diseases physician, um, just here in Washington, DC, 
what I have seen on a good part is some of the same mitigation factors that we had to implement for COVID actually created the opportunity for a decrease uh, in the number of influenza cases that we saw almost non-existent uh, because of the mitigation strategies, the masking, the hand washing, the disinfecting of high touch surfaces. And I think that we have to look at simple things like that um, make it part of the message. Every time we see an HIV infected person, really talk about mitigating other infectious diseases and also uh, the whole issue of vaccine hesitancy, which is uh, fairly strong in our communities of color. And we have worked hard to uh, do some mitigation. I think that every time we see patients uh, for HIV, we should be teaching, we should be encouraging uh, vaccine uptake. Right now, uh, looking at the vaccine uptake and working with my co-PI, uh, it's very low all over Africa. Part of that is because of availability, but there's still um, uh, a lot of distrust. Another thing that I thought uh, would be helpful uh, is to start looking at task shifting and encouraging um, ministries of health and other healthcare entities to look at task shifting uh, from the very inception of any program um, that we uh, are there to help with uh, to ensure that the activities that need to continue just don't disappear because we are not there as implementing partner um, uh, in the in the flesh. And lastly, I, I think that um, with all the implementing partners that PEPFAR has have, um, particularly around HIV AIDS, um, best practices that are developed um, should uh the ministries of health and actually the infrastructure should be encouraged to um include these as part of national guidelines and so as one example so that you have best practices that remain and that are disseminated and not uh isolated um, one of the things that we did to uh, implement decongestion of our flagship hospital in Zambia um, is we looked at a proactive appointment system as, a point, as opposed to giving patients appointments, we allowed them to pick from, um, from a group. And we saw that adherence increased um, missed appointments decrease. The 95-95 improved, uh, right? Because the patients uh, were in, involved directly as opposed to being given an appointment. And that seems like a simple thing, but the Zambia uh, Ministry of Health thought it's so important that they included it in the national guidelines. And so I think those are some simple things that I think can be added as a suggestion um, for improvement where some of the gaps exist. Uh, but I think uh, as a whole, uh, given what I see with the draft uh, strategy, it looks to be it looks to be on track. And so I I will stop my comments there for any questions. Thank you so much, Celia. Um, so very thoughtful and, and um, wonderful ideas for all of us to consider. Um, Chip, may I invite you to uh, close out the panel, please. Uh, thank you, Laura, uh, very much. And to the previous uh, panelists, it's great to uh, be with you and you made my job a lot easier because you covered a 
a lot of key points. Um, uh, I just want to make an, a first comment and then I'll touch on four points uh, and I'll try and do it quickly, Laura, because I know we're over time. Um, uh, first, I, just thanking for you, uh, Anjali, um, and the team for creating the opportunity um, of these listening sessions for moving the strategy forward. Um, I think we all should acknowledge it's kind of the elephant in the in the room, but we can't have a week of listening sessions without acknowledging we're in August um, and there hasn't been a nominee uh, named yet. Um, I think probably to everyone's surprise, I suspect nobody wants that to move forward more than Anjali and the team, but to acknowledge the um, the the really important efforts that you've made in a an exceptionally challenging year. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we should join a strong plea for whoever it is um, that a nominee be moved forward because there is advantage in having a Senate confirmed uh, ambassador. In the meantime, um, we keep going. Um, and this uh, listening session is an example of that. So again, thank you to the team at OGAC for everything uh, that you're doing. I wanna to touch on uh, the strategy itself on COVID on a point that's related to goal three um, and Patrick touched on it uh, related to local and international partners. And then a point about um, HIV related uh, mortality that I think we have to uh, be very clear about. Um, I suspect my comments are going to be um, reasonably well known to everyone already on the call. Um, and so while it might not be new, the point is we need to act on what we know and to deliver better results. Um, I love the phrase in one or more of the documents, or maybe it's just the question that we have the technical tools in hand um, uh, to control the epidemic, but we're not always using those uh, tools. Um, and we haven't always had optimized uh, uh, tools for around pediatrics, but we do now. Um, we have optimized terrific diagnostic as well as treatment uh, tools available for kids. And so what do we do with uh, all of this? And I think the strategy is the, the right place to start. Um, I think the question is, how would you refine it or, or uh, add to it? Um, probably not as a great surprise. Um, my strong plea is that there be specific strategic goals and outcomes addressing children and HIV. Um, including the whole range, uh, including identification, linkages to treatment and between clinics and communities, treatment adherence, uh, caregiver support. If we don't focus on kids, um, we lose uh, and they lose. Um, a point of departure really should be the UN AIDS data um, and the Start Free, Stay Free, AIDS Free uh, report. Um, if everything else outside of the pediatric agenda goes forward, despite COVID, uh, despite all of the other challenges. If we do believe it's possible to be on track for uh, achieving uh, the end of the uh, uh, public ep epidemic by 2030, on present course, that will be a Pyrrhic victory. Uh, I'd go so far as to say it would be a perverse Pyrrhic victory. Because if we don't do things differently for kids, where we're at 95, 95, 95, that still can leave out kids. Where we're at 50% or declining coverage, which we've seen in, in some cases uh, for kids, we can move the whole program forward and kids are still gonna be left behind. Um, I don't think anybody wants to win the war on HIV and AIDS and leave kids behind. But last year, 150,000 children were born with HIV. Um, the target was to be 20,000. Pediatric treatment coverage dropped last year in some places. 5% for, uh, uh, of those living with HIV are kids and they account for 15% of AIDS related deaths. So we need a new deal. We need a new commitment um, and we need new actions um, for kids. Uh, I couldn't agree more with the comments that Wafa and others have made about the importance of data. But then let's look at, let's look at the data that, that we have 
And I think it makes a very compelling case for doing business uh, in a much more focused and committed way around the, the pediatrics agenda. We can also, we need more pediatric specific data. Um, kids were taken out of the FIAs um, at some point. Um, uh, leaving them out uh, means that they are, aren't, we, we don't have the key data uh, collection um, and pediatrics are not then um, part of the decision-making processes. So I would urge um, that where FIAs are really so important and, and are done so well and they drive so many decisions, uh, we are not optimizing what we can know and what we can do if kids, um, whether that's zero to 10, um, are not in uh, the FIAs um, going forward. It's also important to have the pediatrics really clearly laid out in the, um, in the strategy as it moves from this, um, what I think is a very good outline as, it, as that gets fleshed out into a, a full strategy. Um, pediatrics was not in the last strategy, and I, I, you know, PEPFAR's political leadership and influence extends beyond just the program. People read what is most important, um, and if it's not in the strategy explicitly, then maybe it's less important, or maybe it'll get less funding. Uh, and so, uh, by striking a really strong point, recommitting um, uh, in the strategy as it, as it gets elaborated on the pediatric component, much like UNAIDS did in their strategy that was recently approved. They have an outcome area on pediatrics. I think it's strategic outcome, if I've got the, the nomenclature right. Uh, number three is really, really clear and strong. Um, and that's a result like these listening sessions of extended consultation with countries and communities and partners and organizations. Um, and it emerged as a really important uh, area for the UNAID strategy. And I hope and think that that's uh, both possible and necessary. And again, the data compels us um, uh, to be more specific and committed. Um, let me comment uh, briefly on the uh, uh, on COVID. Um, I know, I, 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 it's it's referenced in the documents and in, in the strategy. There there appears to me to be a, a kind of reticence, maybe on the part of uh, leaders uh, developing the COVID response, um, a, a reticence to fully leverage uh, PEPFAR and capacities and, and partners. I don't know exactly what's um, behind that, if that's an accurate read, but I think we have to get over that or push for um, uh, a real clear role for um, uh, the PEPFAR put footprint and partners uh, and so on, not least to try and minimize the disruption of services and the effect that that would have on vulnerable populations. But uh, COVID is clearly a major obstacle, including uh, getting back on track and trying to um, uh, continue to hit the targets and achieve our broad HIV and AIDS goal. So it seems quite counterproductive not to, um, and, and probably not the most efficient way to go about trying to be aggressive and effective in responding to COVID. I think that's necessary for vulnerable populations. I think it's also necessary for success at rolling out um, the COVID strategy. Uh, and I would hope that there's a stronger link uh, between the two, um, or I'm not sure we're going to be able to achieve everything that um, we are, are talking about. Um, I, I want to, like uh, Patrick, I think the uh, goal three is about the, the sort of uh, end game. I think it can and should be fleshed out a little bit more. Um, I think we need a more explicit strategy about the role and the interplay between local partners, um, international partners, uh, ministries, and so on. Um, clearly, the future is increased uh, local ownership, um, uh, leadership, uh, program implementation. We know that works. We've seen it from the track one experience of uh, 10 years ago. We see it in real time now. But let's take the next step and really identify where are we trying to get, what, it, what are those uh, uh, relationships, how can they be um, both incentivized um, and strengthened. 
and be very specific because it's going to be quite variable um, in what's needed in terms of capacity building and systems and, and governance. Um, it's going to vary by country context to be sure, but there's opportunity to uh, continue to make great progress there. But let's be deliberate and explicit and clear minded about it so everyone brings the, the best advantages of their respective um, uh, capabilities to that. My last point is, is on uh, related to uh, HIV uh, mortality, um, uh, even before epidemic control is reached, uh, I think PEPFAR can and we all should sharpen a focus on curbing HIV-related mortality, including the very high rates of HIV-related mortality in kids. Um, and so it, it, it means giving more priority uh, to an investment in uh, combating HIV comorbidities and advanced HIV disease. Um, I, going back to UNAIDS report again, uh, the target for 2020 was 500,000 uh, deaths, still an enormous number, um, but that number instead was 680,000 um, dying from HIV related causes um, that was in 2020. Um, including nearly 100,000 uh, children. Um, people living with advanced HIV, HIV disease um, uh, represent about a third of all HIV positive patients in uh, active care. And so there's more, I think, that we need to do around TB, severe bacterial infections, uh, meningitis, uh, et cetera. We can't lose uh, track of that even as we make um, progress on uh, coverage um, and treatment. Um, I let, let me stop there. I'm mindful uh, of the time. I want to reiterate the point I started uh, with. Anjali, thank you uh, for this. Um, I appreciate being with such great uh, panelists um, and really appreciate the work you're doing and the leadership to move us all forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tip. I'm deeply grateful for these uh, important points and um, and um, relying on you at the at the end of this panel to make those for us and to highlight the really critical issues. Um, I want to say thanks to all of the panelists. Um, in the interest of time, I do want to hand over to George and um, see if there are additional comments from participants. We want to leave about three minutes for Iram. Um, at the end, and so um, over over to you, George. Great, thanks very much, Laura, and thanks Andrew and Wafa, Patrick, Celia, Chip, for just enriching us with those great observations. Uh, we'd like to now have this time to um, welcome other implementing partner participants who are on the line uh, to raise their hand if they'd like to offer some additional comments from their perspective. But I'll also encourage you to put your comments in the chat since I suspect we won't be able to hear all of them out loud and we will capture those and those will go into what we use as we kind of move forward on, on refining and further developing uh, this strategy. So uh, Helen, I'll ask you to come off mute and speak the comments that you had put in the chat earlier. And in the meantime, anyone else who'd like comments, please go ahead and use your the raise your hand function and we'll get to you right after. So uh, Helen, comment over to you and please identify uh, the organization you come from as well as your name. Thanks so much. And while Helen is working on getting off mute, uh, again, I would encourage people to put things in the chat. Um, I see Nina has done that and uh, to raise your hand again. And if you're having trouble, just put that in the chat too with your Okay, great. It's, I, I believe I'm off mute now. You are. We can hear you. Go ahead, Helen. Thanks so much. Okay. So thank you, Wafa, um, for your comment about uh, the data and particularly about the data uh, in terms of capacity development. And yes, in terms of the goal um, around local partners, and uh, you know, we believe that the measurement of of how much um, funding has gone to local partners, that has been effective to a point. However, um, we do believe that it should be expanded at this point. And there are a lot of um, 
there's a lot of measurements out there and the there's the CBLD9, there's the OPI, and there's other measurements out there that should be used at this point. And also just to note that uh, USAID is in um, a, a lot of discussions right now and we'll be rolling out the capacity, the local capacity development uh, framework and strategy in September. And PEPFAR uh, has been part of that and really encouraged that that um, framework is really looks at um, local uh, partners and um, it has a much broader view of what local partners and the engagement of local partners is um, and looks at it as a whole approach and 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 it gets to it in terms of uh, looking at it uh, at both at an institutional level and also at a local partner level. Um, and so really uh, encourage that we align with that strategy as opposed to having a two pillar approach. Um, so that that sort of is what my comment is, is to make sure that that goal also aligns with the USAID local capacity development framework that will be rolled out and and making sure that we're not just um, measuring in terms of the amount of funding that is going to local partners, but that we use the um, OPI and other measurements that get at much more than just the amount of funding. So thanks. Great, Helen, thank you for adding those comments. Uh, and I'll ask David's uh, help in uh, making sure we're capturing the hands. I think, is it stellar, David, that can unmute and offer some comments? Yes, that's great. Thanks. So, stellar, let us know if you're having trouble unmuting. We're all still finding that even a more than a year into this pandemic, sometimes the platforms just don't seem to work the way we expect them to. Uh, so, Stella, can we hear you? Hmm. So, David, maybe while Stellar's working on that, who who else's hands are raised? Maybe we'll have everyone try to unmute his hand. Eunice, could you could you go ahead? Oh, uh, so apology. I think I yeah, raised it by mistake. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's nice, to, it's nice to hear your voice, Judith. <laughs> uh, All right. Uh, Saeed, could you go ahead? Are you able to speak? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, wonderful. I'm Saeed Ahmed. I'm um, from Baylor College of Medicine and based in Malawi. And um, I, I wanted to follow up on Patrick's commentary. He, um, he didn't say it quite explicitly, but he alluded to the fact that much of what PEPFAR has accomplished and its operations have been through implementing partners. And IPs have been critical, you know, in innovating, hiring, training, implementing, and collecting data. And it, it felt to me like that contribution wasn't quite acknowledged. And it's important not just for credit, but also for planning for the future. So in these um, in the documents, the critical role that IPs play, I seem to largely be missing. And IPs have, you know, the operational knowledge at the moment, you know, how you do index testing, how you do couples counseling, how you do disclosure. And given that that critical body of knowledge rests with IPs, the role that they play in this coming in these coming transitions likely needs to be more explicit. Will their roles change? Is the focus on local partners enough? And our national government's going to want to continue with this IP based strategy, or will they want to transition much of this knowledge and operations to, to ministry counterparts and how will that work? So I was just going to put in a plug for being more explicit about the role of IPs 
and how IPs are envisioned to participate in the coming coming transitions and coming strategy. Thanks. Thanks very much, Said, for that for those additions. Uh, David, do we have anybody else with hand raised? Uh, Kelly, can you go ahead, please? Um, hi, I, I think actually the hand goes up when you type in the chat potentially, but um, I'd be happy to just summarize my um, my comment that I wrote in the chat. I really appreciate um, the outreach to the IPs here and the opportunity for us to share um, the lessons that we've learned over the past 18 plus years as implementing partners. Just wanted to um, highlight uh, here that I really think a focus on prevention is critical um, to consolidate and ensure the sustainability of epidemic control. As, as Wafa mentioned, epidemic control is not a static state. And I think um, we have seen in several cases, um, particularly in high burden countries, um, you know, hyper endemic countries, that you can achieve very high um, treatment coverage and still have ongoing high incidence. Lesotho is the case in point there. And so just wanted to put a plug in um, for considering more, um, more clear prevention targets, um, you know, and to potentially consider a budget code or kind of a um, a consensus target around the prep scale up that everybody could um, line up behind implementing partners, you know, host country governments um, and the implementing agencies. I think we saw that that was associated with really rapid progress in the VMMC scale up. Um, and I think that uh, a hard target that was adequately funded could do wonders in the prep scale up. Thank you. Kelly, thanks very much. It was nice to hear from you. Uh, and I want to acknowledge the comments in the chat box from Nina and Fred, Achonye, Kimberly, and Hallie. Appreciate those. Those will also all be captured. Um, thank you all for um, this sort of open session participation. And I'd like now to, to turn over to Iram for the last couple of minutes uh, to do a bit of a recap for us uh, of what she heard today. Iram, over to you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Laura. And thank you to our wonderful panelists for a wonderful session. Uh, there's a lot of information here, so and we have a short amount of time. So what I'll do is um, <clears throat> talk about the main themes that I heard. So uh, I'm I'm happy to hear that Laura did not plant the seed about data, 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 but all of the panelists did really recognize the importance of evidence in the program, responding to the gaps that are identified through our data, and I think these comments around prevention are very clear. Um, responding to where new infections are coming through and prevention for key populations. If I could um, uh, paraphrase what Pat said, next generation dreams, and then looking at key populations and what the next generation KPIF would look like. Uh, secondly, um, a lot of discussion around explicitly stating the end game and goal three. We are in uncharted territory and really need all of our collective experiences through uh, our implementing partners and operationalizing the day to day implementation country by country. How does that get sustained? How does that get anchored? And I like what Andrew said about having um, uh, talk about the mindset and the local ownership and what does each. Uh, African government need to do? What do the indigenous local partners need to do? And really explicitly getting to very de uh, spe specific details that we surely don't have here just at SCAC and need everybody around the table to, um, to uh, uh, contribute to. And then I think more broadly, two pieces that are very broad, one about specific populations that are still needing to be addressed. Even if we reach 95, 95, uh, 95, there are still are gaps in pediatric populations and uh, poor outcomes for, for children. Uh, 15 to 24 year olds and understanding where those gaps are and then key populations. And so is 95 enough? Are there specific pieces that need to be further fleshed out? And the real time data uh, that Wafa mentioned and uh, pragmatic and parsimonious would help us understand what our gaps are and responding to those. And then on the other piece about uh, vertical integrated COVID health security, all of these pieces where we have a broad far footprint 
and assets that all of you have built over the past 18 plus years and so grateful in figuring out those details from the beginning of the emergency plan and now where we are with epidemic control and truly understanding that end game. And thank you for your, uh, Patrick, about the MCC and looking at different um, uh, models and trying new things and innovation and getting into this next um, into this next phase of the epidemic. And I'll just end with what Patrick said about the current world context and the tectonic changes. Yes, uh, recognizing that and understanding that and framing not only where PEPFAR is today, but where the global community is. So thank you so much. We really appreciate all the comments that are coming through the chat. We're taking all of those um, and inputting those into our into our uh, strategy and reflecting on every single aspect that you all have done over the past 18 years. Thank you for your time today. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody.